Welcome to the Vow Studio. My journey to Tone Hinge continues this week with my journeys into what making my controller. Uh, I'm not going down the you know the traditional easy route of of having a you know like an Arduino uh, running um, a bunch of stepper motor controllers and then having a laptop connected to that running something like you know Universal G Code Sender. Where they have to create the file. I want I want to make a tactile feel. I want people to be able to come over and use my machine in manual mode, without having to learn 3D modeling and running the CAM program and generating the G code file and loading it into G code sender and sending it over. It's, there's this it's too much learning curve there. People that know that can use the machine, sure, but people that don't know particularly like my granddaughter. I want her, her to be able to come over there and just cut stuff off on the, on the work beat. So I need a way to, you know, to, I need to basically an operator panel. And we're going to talk a lot about that uh, today. <clears throat> so we'll um, switch over here to Onshape. Uh, I am doing all my 3D modeling over here. And this is the model that I created for the box, the enclosure box that I showed you, you know, this either a couple videos ago. And it's, uh, it's a steel box you know, without any kind of holes in it, which is great. And so um, it's also got an angled uh, beveled uh, front panel. So I'll be able to have a, my operator panel won't be, you know, straight vertical. And so this is what I'm thinking, and I want the uh, the jog wheel to be kind of over on the right hand side of the control panel, because my my physical control panel is really going to be on the left hand side of my work beat. That way, you can uh, you'll you jog with your left hand. You'll have to do lefty joggy, which people have to get familiar with doing, but. You can do things with your right hand, and that's why I decided to put it on the left-hand side of the machine. So this is the board here. This is the box, the enclosure itself. And remember, I had uh, a bunch of these things. I bought a bunch of these at a um, uh, like an auction at a telecommunications company that would manufacture things here. And these are looks like they're buttons out of a a touch tone phone, but they're really just three single pole, single pole switches, single pole, single throw switches. Uh, but there's a little feature on the back here. There's a hole uh, drilled out of the back. So uh, I can put LEDs in from the back side and then illuminate the buttons based on what they're actually doing. So, you know. The fact that I got three is good. So, you know, one of these rows will be axis selection, X, Y, and Z. Or another thing that you want to control on a manual machine is how fast does the jog wheel actually move? You know, is one click, you know, uh, well, there's times one, times 10, and times 100 on the machines I've used. So that means that, you know, one click on the jog wheel actually in times one mode moves the axis one basically account uh, on the encoder. <clears throat> so these are handy. I have about a hundred of these things. So I'm using those and um, uh, let's take a look at the panel I came up with. It's over here. Now in case you want to play around with this you can uh, find my account on Onche because all these are uh, publicly viewable. But this is kind of what I'm thinking. My jog wheel's down on the lower right. And then I have those uh, those buttons over here on the, on the left hand side. And then I have a uh, you know, LCD uh, character display here. This is um, uh, 4x20. So I have a lot of actual uh, room up there for you know things like which axis is selected, you know what X, Y, and Z values are, and that type of thing. Now this is over on a control box. Uh, we've talked about my uh, on right next to the um, the spindle. I'm going to have a rather a larger display here. This is uh, this is one of those Nextian displays from IT. And over here, I'm going to be able to have really you know really large numbers. So 
you're going to basically jog with your left hand and you'll be able to see this because this is going to move with uh, X back and forth and this one's a lot easier to read than this LCD display but I do have the ability to drive them both at the same time and so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So if I take a look at what this is actually looking like and the reason why I did all this modeling you know you're thinking well what's, what's all this why 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 because I need to be able to fit it in the box for one and and uh, I started figuring out all the wiring and uh, there's an enormous amount of wiring that I'm going to need to do and so I decided I better have a circuit board for this so we're going to talk a lot more about that the custom circuit board I came up with for my work B to do the controller part of it and and I've been burned in the past where the mechanical design uh, I can't mount my circuit board because I just go ahead and assume I can put my mounting screws in the four corners but in this case here I can't actually do that because you'll see on the back side of this thing is that if I just did the four corners of the board I'd have a problem you know actually mounting it so I had to do the 3D modeling to figure out where my mount holes are going to be and so I'm going to pick you know a hole right here a hole right here a hole right here and this hole is a little bit off because if I picked this area right here uh, which would be a line with this hole then it, then I have a collision point and I can't have a standoff to my panel here because the display is in the way. Now I got all these models. These are all SolidWorks models. I got them all over at uh, GrabCAD and I just basically imported them. I did do a model for my, my switch thing here itself. Now this board size I chose uh, 100 by 100 um, because I can get those boards made, made at a company in China called JLC for next to nothing. I mean, literally, we'll talk a lot more about that in a minute. All right, but uh, so I have the, they're going to have the ability for 12 of these switches here. And the 12 switches, uh, uh, I need, I need a way to now to connect everything together. Now I've talked a lot about, you know, uh, the electronics, the controller box, the controller itself, the, the thing that runs Gerbil. Um, you know, uh, the Gerbil is really designed around uh, Arduino Uno, which is a, a Atmel, not Atmel, a microchip AT uh, Mega 328P. And it runs, you know, on these things here on the, the uh, on the, the old, uh, on really old Arduino platform. Uh, but I've opted to use uh, this thing here. This is a, this is a PSOC part. PSOC 5 part from Cypress and this is the um, their evaluation kit for their PSOC 5 and you can buy this from Cypress for $10 we'll see that in a minute but this has a lot more IO pins on it and uh, when Gerbil runs on an Uno or you know an Arduino uh, it's basically maxing out the firmware size and you can't really add any extra uh, uh, functionality into this because the way that Gerbil runs on an Arduino is it kind of, um, you know, ekes out the performance that it, it needs to do all the CNC operations, stepper control actually, and, uh, you know, route planning. And you can't really add any more functionality to this. You, you get what you get. And I've been waiting. Uh, it turns out that I can use this guy because um, we'll, we'll show you why in a minute. But, um, just, just the, the summary of this whole thing with this CAD modeling is I need I needed to know if I could uh, what the size of my board need to be and where the mounting holes are so I, I kind of have that under control and uh, so I decided to take all this stuff and actually create a project on my GitHub page for this it's called Hyatt uh, we'll talk why it, it's called Hyatt in a minute but basically it is uh, my work be here. And I'm using a WorkB 1010, which is a thousand by thousand. And like I said, I'm using this PSOC 5 LP part from Cypress, um, which is this thing here. This is a $10 part. And the, the performance of this PSOC 
uh, it's hard to even say how much more powerful this thing is than that 328p. Uh, I'm not talking about just you know CPU speed because I think this runs at about 70, uh, uh, maybe 67 megahertz, something like that, and the Arduino runs at eight. And uh, but this is a ARM three where the Arduino is uh, an old, an eight bit um, AVR core. So the PSOC you know uh, is a um, it has a uh, F basically an FPGA fabric and it also has an analog fabric and a ARM M3 processor all on one chip and you can get this entire board for ten dollars uh, it's just like mind-bogglingly cool so we'll we'll talk a lot more about this in a minute <clears throat> and uh, let's go back to my github page here And so if you want to come and look for this, this is called Hyatt over my GitHub page is Hollow2040. And so here's my my uh, my circuit. We'll talk a lot more about that in a minute. And here's my layout from my board. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and uh, check this guy out. We'll go and clone this um, project. And let's see here. Let me delete this if it's already there. So I'm going to come in here and I'm, I'm running on Windows 10 but I'm running the Linux subsystem so I actually have an X term uh, running and it is great if you haven't done that before. Uh, I've been running Linux desktop for 15 years but I do have a Windows 10 machine I dual boot my desktop and so I'm doing things in Windows today. All right, this guy here, uh, the Hyatt project. If we come in here and let's just go into the board directory, and I will run um, uh, Gerbil, not Gerbil. What am I talking about? Uh, I did this in Eagle. It's a single. Um, it's a single uh, page design. So that if you want to run, if you want to open this in the Eagle Free version, you can. Basically, here's all those switches over here on the end, and I have these. Um, I can't wire these directly into. Uh, there's not enough I/O pins to actually do all this stuff. So, because I have 12 switches and 12 LEDs, that's 24 I/O pins I need to be able to control. I just don't have that many free. So I'm using this thing here. This is a, another microchip part called a 23017. This is a I/O port expander expander that runs on I2C. And I got two of them together, and you can get these things set up so that they generate an interrupt whenever any of the switches change. Um, so I don't need to continually keep pulling them. All right, so. Uh, here is the uh, footprint for the uh, the kit, the, the PSOC 5 kit. And I have a lot of other things in here. Uh, let me see. Let me, let me open up the design part of this thing and we'll see. Um, I think there's an image in here. Here's a PDF file in here. All right, this is my routing, my wire routing table that we talked about last time. So we are working on this guy down here. So let's zoom in on this block if I can. All right. So inside this block, this is all the things that are going to go in on that this uh, PSOC 5 is actually going to run. Here's the PSOC over here. Now it's running Gerbil and it's running a bunch of other stuff as well. So I have my jog wheel. X, Y, and Z axis selection times 1 times 10 times 100, which is the speed uh, thing I was talking about. We have this select button, this G select. This is going to allow me to change my coordinates, G54, 53, you know, that kind of thing. Millimeters and inches. Here's my zero, my axis zero button. So whenever you hit that and you're, you know, if you're, if you're on X and you hit this, you're going to zero X at that location. I have a park. Uh, button because I want to be able to 
put the machine back in a known position, namely with Z all the way down so that when I lower my whole platform down, um, uh, it will be in a park position as well as the home button itself. And I have the local display that's on on uh, inside the controller box, which is that 4 by 20 display. I have the uh, the three uh, switches that Gerbil wants is reset, feed hole, and cycle start. I'm going to still be able to control this with uh, that uh, DirecTV remote as a, um, what they call those things? Pendant, all right? I'm going to have USB, so when I do want to control it from a computer, I can actually send it a G-code file. My, uh, in the long run, I want to read off of an SD card, you know, much like the way a 3D printer works. You put your G-code file on a 3D on a SD card, and then you load it in, and you can run it from the machine front. And I'm going to have Wi-Fi on it, so I'll be able to make a TCP connection over to the uh, the console port, basically the the, the serial port um, so that if I want to have uh, use some other senders you know Android senders or, or uh, you know, whatever I can send it from over Wi-Fi and I have a bunch of lights over here and I also have this feed override which enables me to change the uh, the feed speed of the way things running in real time because Gerbil supports real-time feed changes but I am going to actually have a potentiometer on that, and I can read all that into the PSOC and change the feed um, whenever I want during operation. So we got all this stuff. We need to be able to account for it. So over on the schematic, I have all that stuff stuck in here somewhere. Here's the SD card reader uh, uh, connector. Here are the feed feed. Uh, these are the, well, it doesn't matter. It, these are all the connections that need to take place. So this is the schematic side, and if we come over and we want to look at the board side, here's what the board is going to look like. It is 100 by 100. And I have those switches coming in from the bottom. So if you, if you, if you look at this um, over here, I have the switches on one side of the board and then on the back side I'm going to have all these connectors on the back side. And I decided to connectorize everything with pluggable connectors so that if you need to pull this all apart, do something with it, you can take it apart and not have to unscrew any of the wires. Alright, so that's the uh, PCB itself and I'm having it made over here at JLC PCB. I chose this because you can do, if we look down here, you can do 100 by 100 millimeter boards and get 10 of them for $2. It's like free. It's literally free. And their build time is two to three days. Okay, so if you come down here, they, they talk about they have 200,000 customers and they get to 8,000 orders a day. A day. That's crazy. If you own a two layer board, it's $58 per square meter. So if you want, what? If, you want, if I want to make uh, a bunch of these boards, I can panelize it with their design. So let's go ahead and take a. I'm just going to run through this because it's. Really quite impressive how this um, how this thing works. I was like blown away at how optimized and how efficient the order taking process is. So over on the Hyatt, uh, you know, GitHub um, repository, I do have a, a, a zip file that I sent over to JLC, and I'm just going to go ahead and load it right now, and I'll show you how fast this thing really is. So it's uploading now. Uh, from here, Colorado over to, uh, I think they do cloud services uh, somewhere in the Bay Area for this particular function. So it loaded into a zip file and it automatically rendered it uh, and brought me up my display. And then I could come over here to my Gerber Viewer 
And here's what the top of the board's going to actually look like. So I can come in here and inspect, you know, a hole placement, a silk screen placement, and kind of do a visual inspection of the board that I'm going to, about to, you know, about to purchase. And this is really handy to see your board. This is the this is the component side, and here is the um, the bottom side of the board. So if we come down on my uh, my project page, we'll talk about this thing in a minute. But I have my schematic, the board layout, and then I also have uh, screen dumps of this, and these are actually in higher resolution if you click on them. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's load the project into the uh, Cypress uh, tool. So that is going to be. Let's see if I can get this going here. I don't have a. I don't have this pin down here. Where is the? All right, PSOC Creator. Now oh, this is going to be interesting to watch this thing. <laughs> All right, here's PSOC Creator. So I'm going to come over here and open the project file. So again, I'm in the Hyatt uh, GitHub repository, and I'm going to come down to Software Source Controller, and I'm going to open this workbook, the workspace, and it's going to load in um, my hardware design. And if you've never worked with these PSOC devices before, they're just they're really, really interesting to play with, and this is my first project that um, that I that I worked on that as a as a real project for PSOC beyond just kind of blinky. So if we come over here to this um, this design here, this is the hardware component of of what I'm actually adding into the processor during the build time. So there's a, you know, if you're familiar with microcontrollers, they'll have a bunch of different, you know, fixed um, uh, controllers inside. So let's say you want a UART. So, you know, you might get one UART, two UARTs, four UARTs, whatever. Uh, PWM output, A to D, D to A. Uh, what else would you end up getting? I squared C, SPI, CAN bus. Uh, you know, so when you choose a microprocessor you you choose you know, based on the pin count that you want uh, which what peripherals you want how much flash it has how much RAM it has what the package is you, you do all that stuff but with these PSOC devices you 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 buy the functionality of how many pins you want and then also you buy how big of a matrix of either digital or analog that you want to actually implement in your design. So what we have here, this is this this is coming over from um, this is part of uh, I didn't show you this part. This is part of this project here, which is PSOC Gerbil. Um, this is a, a Bart Dring's a port of Gerbil to the PSOC 5. And he just basically released this uh, 25 days ago is when he actually uh, published his first thing. And so I took that, I cloned this project and started adding things to it. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at over here. So a lot of this stuff is his and then I'm started adding in all mine. So like here's I want a UART, so I dragged the UART component over, I drag over the EE prom, I dragged over two UARTs. Uh, when he does limit switches, he has he uses some digital uh, digital components. They're they're, they're debouncing circuits um, for the switches. And the stepper motor controls, um, you know, Gerbil spends a lot of time uh, with interrupts. Uh, controlling the the shape and as well as the frequency of the step pulses, but these uh, control registers you can configure them to be pulsers. So when you change a value in a control register, it actually sends out a pulse, which is really handy. 
this has the capability of running a step uh, step frequency really high. Uh, uh, Arduino's uh, is are limited to 30k um, based on their clock speed as well as their interrupt lat latency. But this runs so much faster that you can actually run your step timer a lot faster than what you can on um, on an Arduino. And here's the uh, those control pins, you know, reset, feed hole, uh, start, spindle control. Here's another PWN to control the spindle. On the analog side, on my design, I got three analog signals that I want to run into uh, into an A to D converter, and those are the motor current, so I can monitor how how much current the actual motors are using. Uh, feed override, which is my potentiometer for feeding, as well as what is the input voltage coming in? Here's my uh, IR decoder um, for the the uh, Direct TV RC65 in um, remote control, and then over here I have my I squared C controller, my quadrature decoder for the my jog wheel, and an SD card interface, as well as a bunch of extra IOs. So what you end up doing in here is you build this thing called, they call it an application. A lot of people think the application is the software build of it, but on the on the PSOC side, building the application is building the hardware component to it. So it goes through and it does things like what you, if you're familiar with doing FPGA work, it goes through and runs this fitter, so it first fits the analog section, and then it will go through and fit the digital section based on what components that you've actually put down here. Now, you can go in from a digital perspective. These are high-level blocks that I've drug out of their, their, little, their little component catalog. But you can come in here, and if you're you know, an old-school digital guy, you can, you know, it can say, here's an OR gate, and you can actually get an OR gate and you can drag an OR gate onto your design like that. Okay, and you can wire things up this way as well. And you can create custom components as and look at the Verilog of the component itself. So if you if you uh, fully understand FPGAs, then um, you know with EDA tools you can just write everything in Verilog and wire them together like you do over here. So over here on the end, it shows our resource meter. This is this is the resources that are part of this particular model of the PSOC 5. And I'm using all the digital clocks, uh, my one USB controller. These UDB blocks are the programmable blocks that implement all this stuff. And then all the over on the analog side itself. Um, when you click on this over here and you open up um, this tab, it loads up how the analog actually gets routed inside the chip. So you can look at how things actually take place. Uh, and you know, if you if you zoom in on here, you can kind of see these are all my analog inputs. And there I can I kind of optimize the pin placement based on on the analog section. And then I let the digital fit or fit everything else. When you get your application built you can you the last thing you end up doing is coming in here and mapping the digital components to the physical pins on the part so there's a lot of videos on on on, on this particular operation but you can basically take any functionality of any of the analog or digital thing and map it to any pin on the microprocessor which is pretty common on FPGAs so I went and optimized my pin placement based on you know how this was physically located on the board. If we looked at the schematic again, actually if you look at the board layout, come on. If you look at the board layout, I optimized my trace placement uh, based on on the location of the connector itself to the evaluation board which made my traces really simple and I was able to keep it in two layers an example of this is this is X Y Z and A and the coolant and the spindle control and all these all these traces come in on this one side of the of the connector 
and then all this other stuff comes in on this other side. So there's very few traces, uh, you know, going across underneath underneath this board. All right. Uh, the other thing I, I didn't mention was that you're able to actually put in, if we look at the schematic here, I put in, where is that thing? Oh, it's down. It's down here. I put in a voltage regulator that, and then I found a part number here. If you look at the notes file, I found a part number for this. You can use a traditional, you know, 7805. Um, this board runs at 5 volts. You can use that, but that has a limitation of the input voltage, on which a, on a what is that? TO220 package is probably about 28 volts. But you can get a, D, uh, a DC to DC converter that will go up to almost 50 volts. So we can run all the motors with. We can do this whole thing with one power supply. And you know, my power supply, I'm going to not use 24 volts. I'm going to use 36 volts. And with a DC to DC converter, and convert that down to five volts. It still fits in the same footprint as a as a TO220 package. All right, I, I hope I'm not boring you to death. Um, but you know, these are my thoughts that some people seem to want to listen to. <laughs> All right, so uh, over here, if we come over here to my account. This is another thing that kind of blew, what kind of blew me away. It was, um, it was my order history. You know, I'm a new customer. And, oh, what happened here? There we go. So, here is the process itself. And here is a time mapping. When you get 8,000 orders a day, you got to get your process down. So there's this whole thing comes down, and we can see that my board made it through in actually two days. I, I submitted it on uh, Monday evening, and it is now Wednesday evening, and it looks like it's good. However, I have a it looks like I have a warning here. I have a quality complaint. I don't know. Oh, that's for me. No, well screw that. I don't have it. I don't even have the board yet. They're going to ship them out to me uh, to the United States of Colorado um, for eighteen dollars. And it comes DHL Express, so it should be here in about five days. And that's only because I live in uh, kind of a rural Colorado, and, and they, they uh, DHL doesn't drive, uh, you know, DHL trucks over here. They actually have private couriers that actually do that work. All right, it's probably way too much information you didn't care about. All right, so that's where we stand on all this stuff. Um, I haven't started implementing the software component to it, but I did bring it. I did bring it into uh, the PSOC thing here, and I was able to fit all the hardware components into the part that I wanted. And and by doing this, it makes the software that much simpler. An example of that is, let's look at over on the design portion. Let's look at the analog section. Um, actually, where is the? Right, here's the input stage. Now, remember, I was going to use that uh, piezoelectric uh, element for my probe instead of a, you know, just a touch probe. Um, by using that that uh, piezoelectric element, I can actually have a, a a finger coming out of it and do all three axes with one probe because I can sense with this with that element, a piezo element, the the taps on all three axes. And in order to do that, remember we measured, uh, I measured that, and I talked about that a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago. The output voltage of that piezo element uh, is a, about 100 millivolts. And I need to amplify that up in order for it. Uh, my, my, my plan is to uh, give a little gain to that, a little amplification of that up, and then when it gets above a threshold, actually fire an interrupt, which would be very equivalent to the touch probe coming down and touching ground. The software is not going to know the difference, but I'm going to be able to do all axis, uh, uh, basically zeroing my workpiece. And wouldn't you know it, the analog section has a programmable gainer uh, gain element in here. And I can come in here right now, and I can change the gain from 1 to 50. 
uh, and then you know it by changing this my gain bandwidth product actually changes but you know I don't care about that because um, I'm gonna be down you know in the low frequency range and then I'm gonna use one of the internal DACs a voltage DAC to to, to set up for my threshold level and then I'm gonna run that into a, a uh, comparator here with a hysteresis loop on the front so basically when the pulse comes out of my piezo element gets amplified when it gets above a threshold it sends it over to the status the status register and then I get an interrupt and then I know that I'm at the I've touched the actual part all this stuff if you did this externally on a shield with an Arduino uh, you'd have to you'd have to buy an op amp you'd have to buy a potentiometer to set this this uh, this voltage here which is and then you'd have to buy a comparator and then you could run the output from the comparator in and if the output from the comparator was the wrong inversion and the wrong output level the logic level whether it's it's uh, high or low this thing here then you need a you need a not gate stuck on on the end of that or you have to change your interrupt handling you know if you're rising or falling edge but over here you can actually add um, add that not gate on the end of the you know, comparator itself. So this is an example of the, the power of the PSOC is that you can uh, just drag these components out and wire them together virtually on, on the, in the work tool and then when during the build process it figures out how to route all this stuff together internally. So I kinda after I did all this stuff and looked at how powerful it is and how utterly simple it was I was sold on these PSOC devices. It's like, it's just great. It's just great. So let's get down to one last thing. I, somehow I got something in my eye. So I named this project Hyatt. Now, why do I do that? All right. And I like to come up with these goofy names, not goofy names. They're tribute names, actually, because there's history behind this whole, this whole project comes down to, uh, what speaker should we use for what how, the cabinet design? All right, who is who's one of the founders of all this stuff? Not Leo Fender. Well, yeah, he's one of the founders because he you know he started Fender uh, Fender Instruments. But actually, I've been reading this book here. It's called The Sound Heard Around the World, and it is a this is an excellent book that covers the history of of uh, Fender. And we're talking about history from, you know, pre-World War II when Leo was, you know, growing up and what he did when he was a kid. You know, it goes all the way back to that level. And then it works all the way through and it tells all these crazy stories. And, you know, on page, what did I say down here? On page 28, we talk about this guy here. This is Dale Hyatt. Dale Hyatt was the first uh, employee over at Fender Instruments that was learned how to do finger joints for their amplifier enclosures because he went over to the furniture maker that was making their cabinets and stood behind their makers, their 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 employees over at the at the, um, it was actually a suitcase manufacturer. The suitcase manufacturer, he, we watched how they did it, and he brought it back and he said, this is how they do the corner joints. So naturally, this whole thing for me is about, um, you know, a big portion of my work be is these finger joints, and so I named this project after Dale Hyatt. All right, I know it's a really long, thanks for watching, this is the Valve Studio.